Welcome back to History on a Hog. I'm Captain Boss. So in Part 8, I described several options of the British attack plan to seize New Orleans, the linchpin of their southern strategic plan. And I also explained General Andrew Jackson's brilliant defensive plan to counter the British. Remember, Jackson's plan was to prevent the British from using any of the three major southern ports that could support their operations, those being Mobile, Pensacola, and New Orleans. Jackson was also very worried about the vulnerability of Mobile to British attack. So he immediately bolstered Mobile's defenses and sent a military detachment of 160 soldiers and a dozen cannons under the command of Colonel William Lawrence to Mobile Point to re-establish a fort that had been located there. They named it Fort Boyer. By controlling the entrance to Mobile Bay, the Americans would prevent the British from sailing up to and attacking Mobile using their powerful Royal Navy. But the British had come to the same conclusion. The seizure of Mobile was key to their plans. And the easiest way to take Mobile was to sail into Mobile Bay and seize the city using their Royal Marines, supported with artillery fire from their ships. But in order to do this, they had to first take Fort Boyer. The British plan was to simultaneously attack the fort from the rear with British Marines, who had already been landed to the east of the fort, and from the sea by four British frigates that would blast the fort using their cannons. The hope was to distract the American defenders' attention away from the British Marines, who were creeping up from their rear. The Marines would then assault the fort and overwhelm the American defenders. On the evening of September 10, 1814, the British executed their plan. Their forces departed Spanish Pensacola by ship and worked their way down the coast towards Mobile Point. Under the cover of darkness, the Royal Marines landed nine miles east of Fort Boyer as planned. They then took several days getting organized and then slowly began working their way towards Fort Boyer. Five days after their landing, HMS Hermes sailed into the mouth of Mobile Bay and anchored just across from Fort Boyer, within cannon range. By the afternoon of September 15th, all was ready. The British announced their intentions with a simultaneous blast of cannons from all four frigates. Colonel Lawrence and his men returned fire towards the ship, but almost immediately, they were attacked from behind by the Royal Marines. The British combat veterans expected Fort Boyer to fall as easily as the city of Washington had three weeks earlier. But Colonel Lawrence had a different idea. He turned some of his cannons rearward and gave the British Royal Marines a barrage of cannon shot that pinned them down, instantly halting their advance. As the Royal Marines scattered and took cover, Lawrence then turned his cannons around and concentrated on the ships that were now sitting at anchor and firing on the fort. This cannon turning drill was repeated several times and the Americans were holding their own. Then, with a lucky shot from one of the American cannons, a cannonball tore through the anchor line holding the HMS Hermes in position and she drifted with the current until running aground on a sandbar, very close to the fort. The ship was now a sitting duck for American cannons. With the American artillery raining down upon them, the ship was pulverized and there were many casualties. The ship was helpless and could no longer defend herself, so the captain of the Hermes had no choice but to abandon ship. And around 7 p.m., 
he gave that order and then set the ship on fire. She burned for three hours and then, as the fire reached her powder magazine, she exploded into the night sky, sending fragments everywhere. It had to have been a spectacular sight. The site of that explosion is right over my left shoulder. With the destruction of the HMS Hermes, the three remaining ships withdrew from the fight and headed off back towards Pensacola. And what about the Royal Marines? Well, they were left on their own. And after withdrawing towards the east, they ended up having to walk back to Pensacola. The Americans had won a great victory and had denied the British the Port of Mobile. Although the American soldiers defending the fort were seriously outnumbered, they had overcome the odds and won a significant victory. The incredible effort by Colonel Lawrence and his men was a great credit to Lawrence's leadership and to Jackson's tactical intuition and strategic thinking. But most importantly, General Jackson had won another great victory. And the failed British attack on Fort Boyer had confirmed another thing to General Jackson. The British planned to take Mobile and then launch an attack on New Orleans from there. His hunch had been right. It also reinforced his decision to seize Pensacola. He needed to eliminate the British threat there, or these attacks on Mobile would keep happening. The diplomatic consequences be Dan. And so, it was on to Pensacola. The Spanish governor general there had granted safe harbor to the Royal Navy and to the British troops stationed in Pensacola. This ideal strategic location would allow the British to plan, organize, and mount a direct overland assault on Mobile from Pensacola. And after taking Mobile, the British would have a direct overland route straight into New Orleans. So, to Jackson, it was obvious that he could not leave this large British force unmolested in Spanish Pensacola. He had to attack them and force them out of Pensacola in order to disrupt the overall British strategic plan. But those diplomatic consequences he was worried about were real and serious. The United States was not at war with Spain, so his official instructions from the United States government had been explicit. No overt action of war should be taken against Spanish Florida. On the surface, it appeared that Jackson was sticking his political neck out, way out, by ordering the attack. But this really was not the case. Jackson had been privately reassured by Secretary of State Monroe that he would support him with his upcoming incursion into Spanish Florida. Monroe clearly understood the strategic military importance of Pensacola and that the attack was necessary. Monroe would convince President Madison of this. But on the other hand, Jackson also knew that if things went bad, the blame and the political fallout would fall squarely on him. He would risk it. The decision to attack Pensacola was then set into motion. His military forces in Mobile had been diminished to only around 500 men, mostly due to the enlistments running out. But he had an ace up his sleeve. His old friend Brigadier General John Coffey and the Tennessee and Kentucky Volunteer Militia. Jackson had sent a message to Coffey and told him to march south so he could help him attack Pensacola. Jackson took a circular route out of Mobile, initially heading north into the swampland of the Tensaw River complex in order to meet up with General Coffey's command near here at Fort Mims.
Jackson would recruit some local native warriors to his cause, and he would eventually assemble a force of 4,000 men at Fort Mims, a significant force. On November 2, 1814, they departed and began their march towards Pensacola. The terrain they were crossing was very difficult. It was swamp land in northern Mobile Bay and thick forests on the eastern shore. There were no roads in those days, perhaps just native trails, so they would have to build field expedient roads as they moved towards Pensacola. It was an exhausting endeavor. When you come back and watch part 10, we'll take a detailed look at the Battle of Pensacola, brilliantly planned and executed by Andrew Jackson. And we'll stop by and visit with the 250 year old oak tree whose branch Andrew Jackson once stood upon to address his troops who were on their way to Pensacola. It still exists today. Next time on History on a Hawk.